If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or laptop. I use my laptop for the Creative Hour, and it's super convenient. Anchor's layout is super easy to navigate. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. So download the Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. This is Jeffrey Clark tap dancing at an event last summer. The date is June 20th, 2020, a Saturday. It's a bright day with a mixed crowd. Everyone is gathered for an event organized by Black Queer and Intersectional Collective and Freedom from Inside Ohio, formerly known as Columbus Freedom Coalition. The event is titled Until We Are Free, Speak Out for Black Lives and it is being held in front of Mayor Andrew Ginther's house. And since I'm among the organizers, we brought megaphones. Like many people watching, this is my first time seeing Jeff tap dance. The moment is powerful because it's smack dab in the middle of a pandemic and countless episodes of police violence downtown due to the George Floyd protests. For a moment, the sound of Jeffrey's shoes relaxes the crowd, uses a language we are not used to. When he talks about the history of tap dance, it is also my first time learning about the black roots of the dance, which broke so many barriers and changed so many lives, Jeffrey's included. Welcome to the first episode of the Creative Hour podcast. This is the Creative Hour podcast, and I'm your host, Prince Shakur. This is a podcast about conversations between artists across mediums about the creative moments and projects that changed them, broke them down, or liberated them. Because this podcast believes that every artist deserves to talk about their art with an environment of radical vulnerability. This episode is very special because it is the first of the Creative Hour, and I'll be interviewing Jeffrey Clark. Jeffrey Clark is a dancer living in Columbus, Ohio. After studying various forms of dance while growing up, Jeffrey joined Tapestry Dance Company as an apprentice performing in national and international venues under the direction of Asia Gray. Since then, he has spent time in Seattle, Washington, producing dance workshops, tap jams, and teaching classes at VAM Studios. Jeffrey is continuing his studies, attending classes and tap festivals, as well as constructing a new personal relationship with teaching. He is deepening his improvisational practice by immersing himself in his local jazz community and considering the lineage and relationship from jazz to tap dance. This conversation ranges from the impact of supportive families on young artists, how burnout is real in the tap dancing world. We also share some passages from Hanif Abdurraqib's new book, A Little Devil in America, and how dancing, especially for black people, is like using another language. Please enjoy. Music featured on the Creative Hour podcast has been made by Sam Holman Smith and Katembe Afro Latin Clear Mix by DJ Pangani. Okay, hey everyone, this is Prince here. Welcome to the Creative Hour, and we are here with our very first guest for episode one. We have Jeffrey Clark here today. How are you doing today, Jeffrey? What's up? Um, I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. Okay. Um, how are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, this is my very first time setting up this podcast, setting up this video cast. We got the whole setup and uh, I'm a little nervous, but I feel good. So I think to commemorate this first episode, uh, I think it's always good to have a ritual with every project. I have a little bit of whiskey here. So let's take a little sip. Oh, you got it. You took all, you did most of it. Um, and I guess that kind of goes into my first question. Um, what is your story? What kind of family did you come from? Um, what are your earliest memories of uh, little Jeffrey? Oh, gosh. And yeah, I grew up, um, I grew up in Gahanna, um, which is like a suburb here in Ohio um, of Columbus. My earliest memory of myself was probably, I used to just be a little rambunctious, like ball of energy. I wasn't ever allowed to have sugar. I, that's why I got put into dance because I was just I had so much energy all the time and no one knew what none of my, my my family they didn't know what to do with me. Yeah, I grew up in Gahanna. I started dancing when I was pretty young. My sister took baton lessons at this dance studio and 
I would have to go and be with my mom while we were waiting for her in class. And so, again, I was just like running all over the studio, jumping around. And I noticed that I could see the tap dancer's feet underneath like the crack in the bottom of the door. So while my sister was in class, I would go to the class next door and lay down on the floor and watch their feet through the Mm. crack in the door because I could only see their feet. And I loved it. And I would always like make my parent, my parents or my mom or dad who was ever with me um, wait 15 minutes after my sister's class to wait to see because like the last five minutes of class they would open the door Mm -hmm. so i would always make them wait until this class would open their door so i could like watch their Mm -hmm. watch them actually do their full entire performance or their full entire dance um yeah i was just always wanted to be dancing i didn't really realize that i never thought that i wanted to be on stage and performing but i was oh i always wanted to dance and even when i was like just taking basic i took a boy's hip hop tap mm. class and it was um 30 minutes of tap 30 minutes of hip hop and even when i did that like i would come home and constantly be tapping my feet when i was in the shower when i was cooking food just like i was had energy all the time and that's was channeled into dance yeah and and i guess what i think is interesting about that is I'm thinking of me growing up like I was kind of the opposite. I wasn't a very active kid. I think I had energy, but I I guess I'm just wondering, like, if you could look back at that young age as like an active kid, as a kid with a lot of energy, like what what did it offer you outside of just a place to put your energy? What did dance offer me? Yeah. Yeah. Oof, that's such a big question because dance has been like such a big part of my life, mostly because um, I like... When I was young, I didn't realize, you know, one, that I could be good at dance or that I enjoyed it as much as I did. It was just something that I did, like it was, you know, a weekly thing. And it wasn't until one of my teachers, like, took me aside and showed me how to, like, practice. No one had ever done that before. And so, yeah, I went to class, but it wasn't, like, something I was super mm-hmm. passionate about. I just went and once a week I would do my dance. And, um, but until my teacher like, took me aside and showed me like, really like break this down and practice this because that was, that was not something that had been taught to me. I didn't, haven't really been taught how to study. I hadn't mm-hmm. really been taught how to like practice dance. So that really opened up like what tap dance could be for me. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, I would also say like the community just uh, in, in, in the, the tap family is, very um tight like there's yeah you if you go to a city and there are tap dancers there there's most likely it's most likely that they all know each other you know what i mean like whether it's la new york chicago austin texas um seattle washington like there are people there who tap dance and they all know each other and it really um there are a lot of spaces that feel um, like a family vibe as in like you can come and you can um be supported Mm -hmm. um you can you know reach when you're dancing yeah for like when we're talking about like improvisation for example um it's not an easy thing to go and improv in general um so it makes it a lot easier when you're in a group of people who are gonna support you make you feel good Mm -hmm. you know what i mean even if that is calling you out and being like yo that left side's weak as hell like you you gotta get that together yeah um there's still that love there um yeah, it's I, I, the the community is just this is amazing. Um, I when I was in Seattle, we did a workshop called um, the Diane Walker Experience, um, and my friend Jesse Sawyer's. It was most it was pretty much her event. I helped out a lot with that event. Yeah, most tap festivals you go and there's like six teachers, and you have to try to absorb all this from these different teachers. But it was a really cool example of like if we have one teacher and have this small group of community of people who've been following their work and following um their teaching and if we have those people come together and show up Mm. like what happens then i mean it was very it was it was amazing because you know what i mean instead of having to concentrate on six learning six different routines or six different styles of technique um, yeah you're learning from one specific teacher over a course of days. It, you also don't have the constraints of like, oh, you have an hour, two hours in this one class, and that's all you have mm. with this teacher. So we had not only the full weekend, but you had multiple classes a day with that yeah. teacher. So it opens up the ability to like really dive into what their technique is, what their you know style is all about, what their teaching is all about. And Diane Walker specifically is like an elder in the community. 
she's like that's how she is like you know what i mean like she comes in with her purse she's cracking jokes she's yeah. loving on all the little kids she makes everyone feel good and included and that's yeah. so important because it's tap dance there are going to be people who are a bit better people who are hired more so it's really nice to have those people in the community as well that are trying to make people feel involved and yeah yeah um because everyone is still important and everyone has something to offer and i think that's also extremely valid yeah um like you can take a class from someone who's been teaching for 25 years and you're going to learn something and you can take from someone who's been teaching for four days and yeah. you're still going to learn something if you're actually present and aware in the class yeah. because you should, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I guess to kind of, I'm, I'm still thinking of like the memory of you, like seeing the, the, the shoes tapping and like how that kind of stuck with you. And I, and I guess I'm also like, I was looking at uh, the tapestry dance company, website and i i don't know and i and i guess this was just like a thought and now with now you explaining like a bit of your story and how dance was a, such a big thing for you at a young age i noticed on the page like a lot of the dancers are like i started when i was 10 or i've mm-hmm. been tap dancing for 20 years or i started when i was like four mm-hmm. um wh- wh- what do you think it is about tap dance that brings people to it or dance in general <clears throat> at such a young age or or h- how do you see like why did it impact you at such a young age or why why might it for other other dancers as well um i think there's just like a a specific kind of joy that tap dancing brings out like not dance is something that i think brings a lot of joy to a lot of people and a lot of Mm. people when they move their body feel that joy but there is another level when you're moving your body and you're dancing but you're also making music that is just um I don't want to say ungodly, but like, it, it's just, it's it's like a next level, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I think specifically for black people, um, so for the, like, the history of tap dance, uh, Master Juba is like the first person who they say like tap dance, like put on shoes and like made specific rhythms and yeah. d- on purpose to do, be doing tap dance. But the history of tap dance is that when slaves were brought to the United States, they would were not they were told that they were not allowed to sing. They would get in trouble if they were singing or mm. talking to each other. Um, and so they would they would took away instruments from these people. They weren't allowed to make their music. So they started yeah. learning how to use their bodies to yeah. do that, and so on and so forth. Tap dance came about. Yeah. Um, but so that's why I think being a black person in tap dancing does have like a, a deep there's a deeper connection there you know what i mean yeah, um yeah. and so i don't know if that's why i i'm excel at tap dance but i think specifically there is something about making music and dancing for me like yeah moving your body and dancing to music feels amazing yes but like when you're also making music it's just that's why improv for me is feels so um powerful i yeah. guess because you're literally making music on the spot just like a drummer would be doing or yeah, yeah. X, Y, Z. Um, and it just amazes me um, that we're able to do that because there's not really any other dance form that does that where you're making music. Yeah. And there are some other kinds of, um, you know, percussive dance forms for sure. But it's just, it really blows my mind how tap dance works. And I think another thing is if people go to a tap festival and experience that community, mm-hmm. they understand that is what draws them in. Cause like, that's, that's something that happened to me. My tap teacher, Tiffany Schlater, yeah. she took me to a tap festival called CHRP, Chicago Human Rhythm Project in Chicago. I can't remember how old I was at the time. I was young, okay. a little, probably like a teenager, middle school. Middle school. Yeah. Okay. And I went with a bunch of these girls that I danced with at the studio and I looked up to all of them like they were, I just thought they were the coolest. So I went with them and this was the first time I also had taken from a black male teacher. All my teachers before this had been white folks. Um, Not that that's a bad thing in specifically with tap dance, but for the history of tap dance, I think it is definitely important for me to be taking also from black people. And and that's something that's, I will definitely give my teacher credit for. She was 100% the person who was like, not my parents, not anyone else. My white tap teacher was like, I want you to go take from black tap teachers, black tap masters in this form. Because you need to see that. You need to see what what they can do, what you can do, what you have the opportunity to be. And also, I had only ever, not that I need to dance like a man, but I'd also only ever seen women tap dance. Like there were no other men at my studio. So I think 
to see another black man tap uh, tap dancing, um, not necessarily masculine, being masculine, but to tap dance yeah. was something that was important for me. And um, and how did you how did you get to know the black side of the history of tap dancing? At, at what age or how did you learn? Again, that? my my tap teacher Tiffany uh, Tiffany Schlater, she okay. um in, like would actually have us do tap history. Like I remember in summer classes, I think it was the first time we would have she had a we had have a list of tap masters yeah um and is what we call them and they would we'd have to pick one for the week and you'd have to like find information about that person basically mm. study up and then come back and tell the class about wow. them okay um and i can't remember my first tap dancer that i connected with in that way like or, or that i like did a bunch of research on but i do remember to the same person, my same teacher gave me all of their footage because she danced um, in a company uh, in Chicago mm -hmm. who did, ended up doing the promotional tour for Gregory Hines' movie Tap. Mm, okay. um, so she was like immersed heavily in the Tap community in her time when she was actually dancing yeah. professionally. She gave me all of her footage. It was on a mostly VHS at the time. Wow. And so my dad went through and recorded all of them, re-recorded all of them so that I mm. could have all of them. Wow. And like all of it is, you know, all these like old black tap masters on like Gregory Hines, Sandman Sims. There's this one of, ah, uh, who is it? Um, I think it's Jason Samuel Smith and Arthur Duncan and it's called Tap Heat. And there's like all of these other, you know, I would say prominent tap dancers in this film yeah, as well. Yeah. But it was the first, because everything before this was just, I danced out of a studio. So like we did recitals and competitions. So like mm -hmm. that was the extent of my dance. Like I would go to class, we would practice these things and it was that. But when our teacher started, you know, introducing all this other stuff, I was yeah, like, there's yeah. so much more to this. And when, to my original point, when we went to this festival, that's when I was like, oh shit, like there's these community of people who are like really showing up um, for this art form and who like really love it. And yeah. um, you know what I mean? They're exposing, I was exposed to so many different things. It was the first time I was exposed to improv. It was mm -hmm. the first time that I was exposed again to like black men tap dancing. It was the first time that I was exposed to, it was the first time I saw a tap concert. They yeah. did a, oh my God, it was a, a fucking, ooh, I don't know if I can cuss. It was a, yeah. it was a, <laughs> uh, 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 Stevie Wonder tribute. So all the music was Stevie Wonder. All of the the tap dancers, you know, picked Stevie Wonder songs and they they did their performances and most of it was improv and it was just, it was like nothing I had ever experienced before because though the tap community is huge, it's yeah. so small because we're so spread out. Like tap is not as mainstream as some other dance forms maybe I yeah, would say. Yeah, yeah. and so let, let's kind of go through your timeline a little bit so you started dancing when you were young, you started going to festivals, you got to connect with these other yeah, dancers so. and connect with black dancers and kind of take us through like um, from high school up until now, like what your kind of dancing and creative career has been and what okay, you've done yeah. through that time. Definitely, so um, when I was still in high school, I started assisting my teacher who I was growing up taking from and she taught all over the country uh, mostly in the competition circuit yeah um and so I would go along with her to these different cities and teach with her and then I graduated and I was planning to go like in my head I wanted to go to college I wanted to go to Marymount Manhattan mm. have a dance program not wow. that I necessarily say I think I could get into the program or anything but I definitely York. wanted yes I wanted to live in New York uh -huh. I was like I'm gonna make it I'm gonna be yes. front cover it's gonna be me y'all better watch out yeah um but then I Wow. I missed the audition and they were like, we would like you to come in after. So I flew to Austin. Wow. Went and auditioned with just the dance captain and the two directors. Yeah. Butchered. Butchered the audition. <gasps> oh my Prince, God. Prince. They were like, they taught me this thing. And they're like, okay, go across the floor. My homie, I was, I was horrible. I like literally had no clue what I was doing. But oh I think they understood that I... Oh, word this. <laughs> he said, though I understood, I did not... Um, I did not maybe pick it up as quick as they needed. Yeah. Um, I had the passion for it. Or at least that's what I hoped. Um, then I was a tapestry for a year, which was probably one of the rockiest and toughest years of my adult life. And that was 2013, 2014? Yeah, um, I can't remember if it was 2013, like 2014 or 2014, 2015, okay. if I'm being okay. honest, because okay. I can't remember if I took a, I can't remember, but I was there for one year 
and it was wild. Um, it was the first time that I had left. Like I said, I just graduated. Mm-hmm. I had not gone to college or anything. I'd never lived alone. I had never honestly shopped on my own. I had never yeah. done anything. So like, And you were 18. Mm-hmm, yeah. I found out that I was going to um, <laughs> go to Austin. Wow. Didn't have my driver's license. So I bought a car the week I was moving. Took my license to like driver's test three days later. Yeah. And then four days later, I think. <laughs> you drove? Drove, to, drove with my mom, my wow. dad, my sister, and our cousin, Alan. And, all and, drove. And, and what was their headspace? Were they excited for you? Oh, my God. They... Absolutely. Like, my family has always been super about me dancing. Like, yeah. Um, I, dance is also something super expensive, though I know they always struggle. They never ever like complained about having to pay for it. Yeah. Um, like we used to, to pay for dance growing up, I, me and my mom cleaned the studio every single day wow. or every couple of days when after I was done cleaning, like dancing, yeah. we would then stay after and clean the studio. And that's how I paid for my lessons. They were stoked. They were excited. Like my wow. mom was, I mean, that's all I, at that point, that's all I had ever wanted to do was, yeah, yeah. and you also have to realize at Tapestry is one of the very, very few full-time professional tap companies. What they mean by Tapestry being a full-time company is you're getting paid full-time. So you're getting yeah. paid salary okay. and you're meeting for six hours a day. Wow. Six hours, five days a week. So Monday yeah. through Friday, you're meeting. We had an hour of yoga and then practice after. Yeah. Um, and that would include, you know, warm-ups, improv, learning new choreography, all that stuff. They were they were intense. Like it was it was an intense time. Once I got to Austin, I didn't really realize what I had got myself into with Mm -hmm. the company. I knew that I was going to be dancing at a studio. Yeah. What I had been doing before. Like, we would come in, learn dances, we would have a great time, and then you would go home. But it was, there was just so much that I don't think I had prepared myself for. And there was so much that I think was going on internally with the um, company mm-hmm. that it was just it was a really rough year like I remember I had only improv a little bit before I had moved to Austin and like the first usually like three hours of our rehearsals were us in a circle improv Wow. so my first class people were laughing like it was I felt mm-hmm. so humiliated wow. and like like I didn't deserve to be there yeah and it was, it rocked me. And there were all those, like, there was a lot of other, like, politics and shit that happened in the year that I was there that was just, like, disastrous. But... This next clip is Benjamin Willis, a close friend of Jeffrey Clark's, and I wanted some outside perspective on what it's like to see Jeffrey tap dancing. Here's Ben talking about it. It was divine. I mean, like, when I mean divine, I mean in the most textbook way of describing it. It's like divinity. It's like watching God come down and you're seeing someone who loves sound, like is uh, uh, he's like one with the music. It's insane to watch, honestly. I mean, just the rhythm like he picks up on all the beats all the cues you can see him working it out and like almost a mastery because it's like manipulation of sound really um it's really quite something uh in terms of like photographing him i mean i've always loved photographing jeffrey i just think he photographs well we have a good rapport i think you can see like our dynamic between the photographs but when i go back and look at like the photographs of him dancing you can just see like the movement you can see like him thinking him working things out him responding and loving what he's doing um he holds dance and tap specifically in such high regard and high esteem that he would never do anything to like tarnish it. Um, and so I'm just trying to match that when I photograph him. But yeah, it's truly a privilege to see him work like that. And I wish more people could.
not pushed into a situation where I was dancing with tap dancers that were way out of my caliber like that, then I would not be the tap dancer that I am now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. it also taught me a lot about ways that I don't want to teach. Yeah. That has been really valuable. You yeah. know what I mean? And I, and I, and I guess I want to slow down here because I think this is really important for other artists, especially younger people, because I'm thinking of whoever might stumble upon this interview in the future who might also be black and young mm-hmm. and wanting to tap dance. I mean, what is it that stopped you from like just saying, I'm going to go home? What stopped you from turning back? Like, did you have mm. people that you talked to or was there a moment or a series of moments where you said like, I'm going to have to do this one way or another? Yeah, there was definitely, there was, I think there were a couple moments. There was one moment when my like, my sister stayed a few weeks after to like make sure I got situated. Yeah. And like when she left, that was the moment where I like completely broke down and I was like, just in general and life wise, I was like, yeah. I'm gonna have to figure this shit out. What am out. I doing? Like, what am I doing? Like, do I had not, I have not ever gone to the grocery store by myself in my own car to buy groceries. Cause I had just bought my, you know what I mean? Yeah. There was just so much that I still was learning. And, um, but there were, I, di- I did, my friend, um, I'm gonna use her first name, but Alex that I, they were also an apprentice um, mm-hmm. the year that I was there. Um, and if it was not for them, I probably would have left and probably would have um, not made it through because um, they were definitely my rock and they were yeah. someone who had the passion for it that I had. So even though things were going wrong, we still wanted to be the best that we could be. In that situation. Tapisters. Exactly. Yeah. So like we were still, you know, hustling in, coming in early to practice, staying late to practice, practicing on our own, those kinds of things. Um, but I think also going back to my teacher that I had growing up very much instilled in us that like there, things aren't always going to be easy. Easy. Yeah. And that's usually when it's worth staying around. Yeah. And I will say that to this, I feel very um, proud that with everything that happened, I we all signed contracts. I worked my entire contract to the very yeah. last day. I was mm. the only person my season that stayed on contract their entire season. Wow. And I feel very proud of that because that was I was also the first. That was also the first time I was ever. Like that was my first like professional gig. You know, yeah, that was the first time I was yeah. in a company. Yeah. And. So I was like, I was like proud that I, you know, stuck it out, stuck it out, and yeah. went to the end, even though things weren't ideal. And it was actually they offered, um, they offered me a, a contract like to resign, and that I think was a real moment of like, you made it, you did your year, mm-hmm. you did, you did what you signed up for. Now you have the moment to like, this is your chance to decide if this has been worth it. Do you want to do this? Um, and I think that's when I was like, I don't think this is healthy anymore. Um, because there was even a conversation in my signing meeting. I haven't really told many people this. There was a conversation in my signing meeting with my director and they asked me if I had an eating disorder and told me that if I had an eating disorder, they didn't want me in the company. Mm. And that was just like extremely touching to me because one, my way has always been um, a touchy spot just because I'm I'm skinny and yeah yeah um oh growing up dancing everyone would always be like oh you got to put on weight or you can't be a dancer like male dancers are always yeah. big and muscular you know what I mean like that definitely like, struck a chord with me and I was like this is not a place that I want to be this isn't a place that's healthy yeah for yeah. me to be there were also not really other any other queer or I guess there were queer but there were not other any other black people in power yeah so. I didn't really ever felt taken care of. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I didn't feel like anyone was ever looking out for me. Though we had, you know, people on the board and there were people in the company that were supposed to be doing those things. It never felt like we were being looked out for. Everyone yeah. just felt like kind of felt like the company as itself was always looking out for themselves. Yeah. And yeah, I just didn't want I wanted to be in a place where I could thrive and that I could um learn and grow. And I don't think you can do that unless you can mess up. Like, yeah, you know, especially in art, you have to be able to mess up. And I didn't feel like I had that space to be able to do that without feeling, you know, ridiculed or, you know, made fun of or yeah. whatever it was. And yeah, I just didn't want to live that way. Like I, I it was, it wasn't worth it. And I know someone, the, my friend that I ended up living with, Jesse, um, in Seattle, she was in the company with me the same year. Yeah. And she was someone that I did go to because she has, she's been dancing for a lot longer than I have. She's older than I am. And I was like, I don't, right now, like being in 
quote unquote one of the few tap dance companies full time in the world. You know, I'm getting we're getting paid salary, quote unquote. You're like walking away from that. You know what yeah. I mean? Like people, the teachers even that I had had were like, it's not always going to be perfect. You know what I mean? Going back to that, like then I was yeah. questioning myself, like, am I just being yeah. like, a, a baby here? Like, is this just one of those suck it up? You're not always going to like yeah. you're going to work with, or is it like, no, this isn't a place that I can artistically develop. Yeah, and yeah. that's where I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I can because the 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 trauma that has occurred is just too. Doing yeah things. yeah and I, I appreciate you saying that because i feel like that's also something important for i guess artists to kind of think about or realize because that's kind of one one of the reasons i wanted to talk to you about like your experience like working as a paid dancer because because there is a shift because I, I think it's like when you're young you love art because you love it because it helps you do something more and then i think as you I don't know, kind of get older, it becomes something that you can make a life out of. But what happens when you figure out the sacrifices, whether big or small, in that life? And it's also like you're black, you're young, yeah. and everyone's out from the outside looking in. But right. what do you say from the inside looking right. out? Right. Yeah. Somebody said to me, no one's going to understand everything that you've been through because no one knows everything that you've been through. Yeah. So like the people who are back in Columbus can think whatever they want that you're leaving this gig, but they've not been here experiencing everything that you've gone yeah. through. And I think that's a very good point. I think another good point that I want to make is I was brought on as an apprentice. So mm-hmm. what that means is technically I have to know every single person's piece of choreography mm. so if someone's sick someone gets oh, hurt wow. someone really? can't be at a performance i have to step in yeah it's called a swing like on broadway but it, that's what my <laughs> job was that's what i had signed up f- and i was not going to get paid i would be paid for performances only um and that's a very common wow. thing um and so that's what i had signed up for yeah i got there and ended up performing in every single piece of choreography for the entire time that i was there and still didn't get paid until my final performance i got paid as a performer because someone ended up not going to a, wow. on, on our tour to Canada. So I actually got paid for that. But everything else, I was not getting paid for. That's why I say there was so much that was happening. Like I felt I was feeling taken advantage of yeah. and I wasn't getting paid. So it's like all of these things that are stacked on top of each other. It was just like, I can't. And they did offer me money the next year, but I was like, you want me to do this for, I think it was, I think they wanted to pay me a thousand dollars a month. I was like, mm. I just did it for free and I would not take a thousand dollars a month to do it because oh, no. because it was more important for me to be able to like grow and learn as an yeah. artist and be able to like develop my craft and I couldn't do it there was because because the way the environment that yeah yeah and and I guess this makes me think of uh there was I was doing some research earlier and there was a clip I wanted to show you this is a uh, can I give a little background real quick on yeah Savion? yeah so Savion is like I don't want to say the like. Savion is just, he, he's been around all of the cats, like the old school cats. Like he yeah. was around all of the tap masters and grew up taking from them, being in their presence. So I think his um, proximity to his ancestors is just mm. out of control. And I think that is part of the reason that he is an insane dancer. And I think also um, he really respects the dance. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, like in and out. Um, at least from what I've experienced, I've not taken class from him personally. I have seen him perform, but I have never, um, you know, experienced him in that way. But from what I've experienced, yeah. that's... Well, thank you. you know, I mean, he, was, he was on Sesame Street. Really? He was in the movie Tap with Gregory Hines, Sandman, Sims, wow. um, Farrah Nicholas, like all those old cats. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, he also got to experience them, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, honored to see this knowing that originally it came from, you know, the motherland of Africa. Yeah, I mean, dance is like, this is our language. And all dancers speak the same language. We all know that strip this verbal ability, we can communicate, you know, and um, that's the beautiful thing about being a dancer, the, the, you know, having the ability or the option to speak another language and that language in turn be everything therapeutic <laughs> you know um so uh it's a good thing absolutely earlier you mentioned Jalen. what do you feel from that i mean yeah i just i feel like i agree with a lot of things that he's saying like communicating mm-hmm. in tap dance i very much i know it sounds corny but like the the idea of dancing it out it's so real. Like, mm-hmm. if I'm feeling something real heavy, dancing it out, specifically, if dancing also with other people 
in that same regard is is just magical to me because when you think of improv like when he talks about having a conversation mm-hmm. if we're dancing together and i say ja ja baziga guga and then you go ja ga like that doesn't make any sense mm. but if i was going to go ja ga kajuga guga and then you reply juga ga ga kajuga ga 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 like that makes more sense like yeah. i'm taking a little bit of what you just told me you know what i mean like we're having a conversation yeah, yeah. like that's what he you know what i mean like we can actually have conversation and understanding without even having to speak to each other yeah. you know what i mean and that even goes deeper into community and yeah. having that you know, intense community. Yeah, tap dance is, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it just, I feel it deep. Have, have deep there been times where you've tap danced and you felt like you were able to say things that you wouldn't have been able to say otherwise or you felt things that you wouldn't have been able to feel otherwise? Honestly, that performance that you were talking about earlier when we... Uh, uh, until we are all free, uh, be quick and CFC outside of the mayor's yes, house. exactly. Yeah. Um, when... I did that. That was like the first time that I had um, really done a project that I, not even a project, I was I was just performing, but it felt so um, important because I was like so doing, it was for something important. I was surrounded yeah. by people that I loved and cared who had never really, I had never really danced in front of or experienced. And I felt like I was like, I had, I feel like in that moment I could, um, my ancestors were present. Do you know what I mean? Like it did feel like a very deep spiritual moment, even though it was like an insane moment and an an insane, a wild time. I definitely, I definitely feel that then, felt that then. And I think, I think even when I talk about like dancing it out, like those are moments when dance gives me something that I can't say. Like when I can't put words to how I'm feeling or I'm too upset to be able to talk about it, I can say it with my dance. Yeah. Um, saying it with my dance versus yeah and and, and I, I guess like my end of seeing you perform that day is that i know uh i'd seen uh ben's photos of you mm-hmm. dancing and uh ben willis is a photographer here in columbus um and i knew that in that way you had community or people saw you as a dancer um but i don't know like when like helping organize that event and then seeing you perform and even just you explaining like the history of tap dance. I was like, wait, what? Our people made this shit too? Yeah. (laughs) And and I don't know. And and I feel like ever since then, it just kind of, it catches me when, when you figure out something new or some new compartment of blackness. And I don't know. And and it was, it really was a beautiful moment because it was kind of situated in the middle of a lot of things. Like last summer, all of the protests, like, I think on either side of that day, um, anyone in that crowd was bound to like experience some kind of or like, see some kind of police violence in this mm, city. Mm-hmm. And so and so I think in, in all of the ways that you Oof. express, it's like and even, even like the mother of someone who whose whose child had been mm-hmm. murdered by police here in Columbus. Um, and, and I don't know. And, and, I, and it makes me think uh, like I was researching like some of these, like some of the earlier tap dance figures earlier. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find what I, I made some notes earlier. Like how dancing was revolutionary in a way to center new spaces. So I was watching this video earlier mm-hmm. and it was, um, oh yeah, I, I think it was talking about the person you were talking about. William Henry Lane was born in 1925, moved to Five Points, a part of New York that was mixed black and Irish, mm-hmm. then started performing in minstrel shows, a black mm-hmm. man wearing black paint to perform for white people. By 1845, he was the first black performer to be billed over a white performer in a minstrel show. His talent and courage made history. In mm-hmm. Africa, music was an essential form of personal and uh, spiritual expression. So kind of all of the things that we have been speaking to. But I don't know. Like I was just kind of like hearing about the Clark brothers and all of these like different black tap dancers that like helped create this form of dance and also... I don't know. Like, I, I think of like having to be black and wear black paint to perform for white people. And then you eventually get picked over a white dancer for like a club in Chicago. It's wild to think about, right? Like these cats were also you have to realize these cats weren't just like shuffling around these mm-hmm. fools. You had to have like a sh- like you had to have something special. It yeah. was like. It was either you were a tap dancer and a comedian or Bilbo, um, Bilbo Jingles Robinson. He danced on a staircase that made him really popular. Yeah, so like during, yeah. he would go to vaudeville shows and that was his thing. And people still to this day do renditions of that. The Nicholas brothers down the road ended up 
doing a, a big, you know, tribute to the stair dance. And they did this this huge, beautiful staircase and they did the splits down the staircase. You know what I mean? Um, but it wasn't like you just had to be able to shuffle a little bit on yeah. time. Like these people were doing amazing, amazing things. Sometimes, you know, turning insane amounts of times, dancing really, really quickly. They, yeah, these, these black dancers were absolutely insane. Yeah. And they were every, I mean, everywhere. Like this is people's entertainment. People didn't go to, you know, go hang out at, I mean, this was like the bar had this this music, like yeah. this this music, it was yeah, like a full yeah. band and tap dancers or, you know what I mean? It was it was a full thing. I remember um, one of one of the big the Nicholas brothers. They mm-hmm. were Stormy Weather is the movie where the scene happens where they have the huge staircase and they do the splits yeah. down it, um, and that's like a, a huge iconic moment because it was also the first time that black dancers were not yeah. billed as just black. I, I was trying to find the clip earlier, but there was a clip of a teacher posting showing that clip to a class of like nine-year-old black kids yeah they were all like cab calloway and then it's like a yeah. full orchestra with, of all black folks mm. and then these two amazing dancers come out and those kids started to dance they those men started dancing when they were children to yeah. like quite literally help support their family wow. were part of tap dance forever and yeah. their 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 granddaughter still dances she teaches out of um i think wow. debbie allen dance academy and okay. um LA. Um, so for everyone listening, um, I just pulled out my copy of A Little Devil in America Hi. by Hanifa Durkeeb. Um, it's a book that just came out, I think this this month, um, about black performance and, the, and the opening essay is really amazing. Um, it's kind of like a combination of looking at uh, the history of dance marathons and also mm. uh, Soul Train, the show. Mm. And, uh, and I don't know, I was reading this earlier, kind of thinking of you and I don't know, this this passage in it I thought was really, okay, beautiful. In the name of loneliness, I would watch, I would watch the Soul Train line videos. In the name of a very, dis, very specific dislocation when I moved to a city or visited a city where I didn't know anyone or didn't see anyone who looked like me, I would watch the Soul Train line videos. From a distance with friends who lived where I do not live, I would sit in silence on tele- on the telephone and watch the Soul Train line videos. And after each of them, we would fall into a spiral of naming each person, dancing through, shouting out how you might be related to us if we were if we were so lucky. I had claimed the fantasy of kinship with so many of you, my dear cousins from another life. I have watched your. Oh shit! You might have to read the rest of this. My eyesight is real bad. <laughs> you think your eyes, but you know my, my eyes are friends. Are I can't read. Where? Are you farsighted too? Where? <laughs> oh, this gonna be bad. I have imagined okay. you practicing in your mirrors as I practiced in my mirror before going out to a place that I knew would have the song, the space, the opportunity for me to once again revel in the sin of not being born with your rhythm. My distant loves, I have imagined you with your arms in whatever closet you had, digging for the most luminescent of outfits. I have imagined you unable to sleep or unable to work or unable to do anything beyond pray, to still be alive and standing on the night when the bodies parted for you. And the song was a song you'd woven your body in between the notes of in some time before. So we just figured out they were both far-sighted. Um, I have to be in like the Chinese buffet lighting. Like, you know, when you're at the booth, it's like <laughs> that kind of lighting where I'm like, right? I'm like, I can't see anything. But um, I don't know, I guess I wanted to read that because I feel like it's really centering and it wasn't, and this happens a lot with writing or reading. I don't really realize why exactly I wanted to bring something up until it's read. I guess like thinking of that moment of you performing in front of all of your friends in front of the mayor's house and that being such a powerful political moment, I was thinking as we were reading that, I was like, what are some of the moments of black joy or like black people being together and dancing that I remember? And it was Deja's birthday party and there was a Soul Train line. Mm. Oh my God. And I remember it was summer, it was warm. We were able to be outside, we were able to be together. We were drinking and people were talking and think about it back to it now. And I remember being there and I remember thinking like, wow, this is really nice to have in the middle of this fucked up summer, this this fucked up series of months. And I remember the Soul Train line, (laughs) um, especially because even that felt 
like something, but it's, it's tied to something in what Hanif is saying and in something in what you're saying. And I think it's tied in to also like the past year. Um, mm. cause, and, and maybe this is kind of like kind of going off topic, but I think about like how differently it is for me to dance when I'm alone at home with no one in my house after like such a year of death and violence and trauma. Yeah. Like how, how do you take, how does art operate in your life now or how has it operated over the last year um, with all of the changes and all of the things that have happened? Yeah, um, it's definitely been a, a, a journey. I think I was really struggling when I, I so after I, I stopped dancing, at, um, so after I came back from Tapestry, I really wanted to like take a look at how I was teaching mm -hmm. because I, I guess I would say after I came back from Seattle because it was from that time that I was like, huh. And you came back from Seattle what year? And Seattle, I've been back in Columbia. I came back from Seattle in October of 2020. Okay. Um, and. Wait, what year? October 2020, I came back from Seattle in October of 2020. Last year? 19, 19, 19. <laughs> okay, because I was like, wait, are we? No, 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 no. Oh, 19. my God. Uh, 2019. Um, and I, I just, I, I was really wanted to reevaluate the way I was teaching, right? Mm. Like, I did not like the way I was teaching. Yeah. I felt like I was always teaching in a, more of a way that I grew up learning, which was in a, like, competition setting, which is very much, like, you come in, you better have practice and you know, uh, know what you're doing from what we went through last week. Like, mm -hmm. we don't want to have to go over stuff. Like, you need to know what you're doing. Keep going. And it always felt bad if you didn't have a step or if you've not learned this step yet or if yeah. you, like, were still practicing. Like, it always felt bad. And I really wanted to make be, like, be able to teach in a space where kids were able to make mistakes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because like I was saying, I feel like that's how you learn as a dancer is being able to make mistakes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also having the freedom to show up as you are, especially as teaching kids. I know when I was growing up, you know what I mean? There's so much that we're, we're, we're dealing with already school, all this other stuff. So to be able to let, you know, a kid come into class and have an actual good time, like have fun versus yeah. like yelling at them because they didn't practice yeah. or harping yeah. on them because if you don't practice, you're never going to get better. Like that's what I was ending up. That's what I was yeah. turning into because again, I was in the competition circuit. So it was yeah. like always about, you have to be good enough to when you get on stage that you can win and do these things. Yeah. Um, so I very much want to try to like take an approach of, allowing the students to show up. It's okay if you didn't practice last week, we can still do something. Yeah, You know what I mean? And what do you think that shift changes for the kids learning? Like, what I do just you think? feel like it would be a space that they can actually enjoy, a space that they can come mm -hmm. to. And you know I mean, there's so much pressure yeah. that we're putting on people all the time anyway. So dance, I don't, I don't want dance. That's not what dance should be. To add you to know that. what I mean? Yeah. I don't want dance to add that. To dance to be a moment of, again, Dancing, you know, dancing it out, letting go, yeah. having a moment of joy, not stressed out because you got to go to dance class and you didn't practice last week. And like, I, there was a point when I would like try to like come up with excuses to not go to dance class because mm. I knew I didn't practice the week oh, before yeah. and I was going to not know my solo and <laughs> yeah. my teacher was going to get <laughs> on me. Um, and oh. not, not my, my all means like my teacher was never like hitting me or screaming at me, never like abusive in any way, yeah. but it was still stressful as a kid. You know what I mean? Like doing school and everything else. And I wanted to do well, you know what I mean? Um, and so I feel like having that patience with kids now will allow them to be able to actually grow and ask the questions they need to ask versus being terrified that they should already know this or they're not good enough or they didn't practice enough so they can't come to yeah. class because they're going to get in trouble or they won't be able to learn. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's also like a thing of, I don't know, each student is going to be different and absolutely how they get to where they need to get to, to have that level of commitment for and within themselves, I mm. think. I think of it in terms of like I started writing when I was 12 and I didn't really get any kind of external validation from it until I was like 15 or 16 and and maybe even then until college. And I think in, in those three or four years that I had it to myself, I wrote as much as I wanted. I kind of just explored whatever I wanted and having that space just for myself was good because it wasn't about 
getting a good grade or having an adult tell me that something I wrote was good. It, it, it was more mm-hmm. about finding my own sense of identity. And I think it, and I think it's also like when you're young and you're kind of figuring out what your hobbies and your passions are, it's also when you kind of build an inner world. Absolutely. And so, and so what does it mean to make art when you're figuring out who you are and it's for a purpose, mm-hmm. it's for a competition, it's for a mm-hmm. festival, as opposed to it being something that you're encouraged to do because it helps you figure out more about yourself. Yeah, I think, I think the, in the, at the beginning of me dancing, probably until I was like in middle school, probably yeah. like when I, when I was a freshman in high school is when I probably started. But like before that, I, I, I don't think I had a concept of like, I'm doing this to win competition. I think I was lucky in the fact that we did well. And I yeah. think part of the reason that we did well is because I was passionate about what I was doing um, and thoroughly enjoyed it. So it, so it wasn't so it didn't feel like oh I have to do better in that sense of like I need to win or mm-hmm. I have to win this competition or because we were we we did really well yeah but I think if I because I was in that position that definitely like shaped how I view dance do you know what yeah. I mean yeah. like I'm sure if I grew up at a a place where I didn't have a good tap teacher and I wasn't doing well then that you know what I mean like that would probably make my experience with tap much much yeah yeah Um, yeah and also my teacher like exposing me to the history and allowing me to see you know what i mean people who look like me and people who also don't look like me but Mm -hmm. are passionate about the dance you know what i mean like being exposed to that was definitely super yeah so i think we're kind of nearing the end of this conversation what advice would you have for younger artists younger tap dancers younger jeff oh I would say two things. The two things we're gonna be trust your gut, but also push yourself. And I say that because I think as we were talking about earlier with like Mm -hmm. my career and knowing when to come back or or step back, there there's there's an importance in knowing when to trust yourself and or not knowing when to trust yourself, but trusting yourself Mm -hmm. and knowing when to listen to yourself because When it comes down to it, as I said earlier, you're the only one who's experienced everything that you've experienced. Like not every single person knows everything you've experienced. Yeah. So you're the only one who can make those decisions for yourself. You know what I mean? Trust yourself a hundred percent. Whether that's artistically when you're on the floor mm-hmm. jamming and you wanna reach for something, but you're unsure if that left side gonna hit, you better like, you know what I mean? Like Go trust yourself. Yeah. Be also because I think for dancers specifically, that's where we all get like a lot of trouble is not Mm. trusting the art that we're doing or the work that we're doing or not trusting Mm. that it's good enough. We're not trusting that what we have to offer is good enough. So especially to black dancers, like you are enough, you are good enough. You have something to offer. Yeah. No matter what your background is, like you do have something to offer. Um, Yeah. Trust yourself. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you all for listening to episode one of the creative hour and yeah, like and leave a review. Check out the website for the creative hour at the creative hour podcast.com and stay tuned until next time. Thank you. If you wish to support this podcast, which is run by a black queer artist it's not easy for us in this day and age if you wish to support the creative hour podcast please consider donating on a monthly basis to my patreon i will also add this link into the show notes it is patreon.com forward dash p-r-s-h-a-k-u-r my patreon will help you get early access to these episodes it will help you get early access to newsletters about the writing industry and the writing process and will give you a lot of behind the scenes material that i will definitely be cultivating a lot over the next year for season two of the creative hour